Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dawn of War Unification 7.0 Patch Notes Discussion. Now, I know what you're thinking. My goodness, my gracious, Mr. Landshark. There are a bajillion million pages worth of reading to understand what kind of changes are happening for the most recent updates to Unification. But you are a young man and or woman. I've got, you, I've, I've got your back covered. What I'll be doing for this video is that I'm going to pick the top three most important changes that I feel are interesting for the older factions. Now, bearing in mind that I have recorded and uploaded about 210 videos for Unification in PvP stuff for this channel. So a lot of the changes that I'm going to be talking about are more or less uh, focused and oriented towards PvP. Although in saying that, that will still have an effect on things like survival, things on PvE. So, you know, it still might be interesting, but based on my experience, primarily casting and stuff, uh, all the changes that I've seen so far in the patch notes. That's what we're going to be focusing on, is, is the PvP kind of element. Now, also, this is also going to be quick and dirty. Like I said, there are a million, bajillion, hundred thousand patch notes for each individual faction. So, if you want a really, really in-depth uh, video going for every single uh, note, uh, The Laughing Max, which is a wonderful friend of the channel, he's done a fantastic video that details each individual point. Goes on for about three hours, so he misses no detail, no stones are unturned by his mighty hand and intelligent brain. But, yeah, so, if, if, you, if you've got a short attention span like me, this is the video for you. If you've got a lot more brain cells in your brain than I have, then the Laughing Max, yeah, more the Laughing Max's video is more up your street. So, be sure to look in the description, check out his channel, and, yeah, we'll just, we'll just start with the video in alphabetical order. So starting with the 13th Company. Now, the theme for these uh, patch notes and updates is that we've got the Wolf Den, we've got the Booba Trapped Point, and we've got the HQ. And one thing that the uh, 13th Company struggled with in the previous version is that no matter what you did, no matter how much scrap you stole, no matter how many armies you built up really quickly, you were always kind of struggling with your economy. Essentially, the 13th Company, when they capture strategic points, they don't build listing posts. They get their economy from the armory. But even with that being the case, they, well, just basically struggled to maintain an economy that had parity to other factions that did their economy in the, in the standard way. So, having their Wolf Den and Booby Trap and HQ provide them a little more in the way of uh, blue money and green money or requisition power, uh, that'll do them good. So, I, I quite like that idea. Although the Wolf Den has been reduced um, with their health, health points, but the HQ has also been have, have their uh, build time reduced by 10% as well. So it's quite good. So if, if you're planning to play a little bit defensive, maybe you're playing a team game and your teammates are capturing the map and you're just going to sit back a little bit and build your economy before then coming out and then doing some stuff. Uh, that, that works. So yeah, cool. So for the Adeptus Mechanicus Exploritus, quite an interesting one. So quite a lot of time for the Admech, you've got the opening build order, which most people go with. You go War of the Omnissiah, you go Magic Explorator, you go into the enemy base, Throw it on a turret, let the warrior of the Messiah kill people, and then it does its Wi-Fi ability, which is which increases its morale so it could do more stuff. And then by the time it's like run out of Wi-Fi, Mega Sporter comes over, refreshes it, and the assault continues. And it's a very strong opening, I do have to say. So what they've done for this patch is that they've reduced a bunch of stuff for the warrior of the Messiah. They've made it slower, they've reduced its range, all that stuff. And so it's a little bit weaker. Uh, for the initial opening. But then for the Maker's Explorator, they've reduced the price for the turret summoning by 300 requisition to 250. They've also increased the health of the turret. So they've kind of reduced the initial damage from the Warrior of the Omnissiah, and they've increased the uh, uh, damage potential or the staying potential of the Maker's Explorator. So they haven't necessarily potentially worsened that opening. It's just that they've probably, from, from what I can understand from these patch notes, is that rather than the Warrior of the Omnissiah coming in and basically killing everything, uh, they've given the opponent a little bit more reaction time. There's a little bit more room to, how would I say, to, to adapt to uh, the aggressive opening if that is what the Admet goes for. Which is the standard, it's what you would normally expect from a lot of Admet players, but that's cool. I quite like that. And then one other thing that I've noticed is that the Servitors have a reduced squad cap from 1 to 0. So rather than uh, your build units, which most build units and most factions don't have any squad cap, uh, the Servitors don't have any. So that's quite useful. So rather than spend, because quite often you see for the Admech, 
that they've go for one uh, servitor unit, which maybe slows down their building uh, of the STCs and repairing and stuff. But now they've got no squad cap. In the late game especially, when you've got your Lehman Russes, you've got your Imperial Knights, you've got your other mechanical nonsense, uh, that spider thing I completely forgot. A Hellstalker, that's what we call it. And yeah, so you're able to just have servitors knocking around, repairing stuff, which makes sense in my head. The Admech would probably want a lot of dudes and dudettes, uh, consensually, of course, uh, going around and repairing stuff. So yeah, I, I quite like that. It's, it's not necessarily a nerf, it's just a changing changing of the guard maybe changing of, of, of how they do their major opening which i quite like now the black templar this is an interesting faction uh, on the channel we haven't seen the black templar have much success in pvp uh, quite often from uh, from the games i've seen they start off really strong they've got a really strong tier one and their tier two is a little bit rubbish and then their tier three is quite decent so the idea for the Black Templar, kind of similar to the Dark Elder of, of Vanilla in a way, is that you go in, you do damage, and then hope that the damage you do is enough to reduce your opponent's capacity in Tier 2. So you survive Tier 2, against Tier 3, you finish them off. That is, that, that's a gross oversimplification. Obviously, it's not that simple. But but it, from the games, again, 210 videos that I've watched. You know, I, I, if there's one thing... I, I can't quite explain the, the in-depth, all, all the bits and bobs of, oh well, this unit costs X, Y, Z money, and, well, against Stone Surf action, they're really good. But, you know, in general, that you're going to get a very general um, kind of commentary from me here. So their first, uh, how do I say, that? Their, their first thing that I found quite interesting is that their Tier 2 upgrade is now reduced from 300 requisition and 125 power to uh, 300 rec and 100 power which uh, it's not a major reduction but it's enough because a lot of factions require 125 power or a little bit more uh, so lets them get into tier 2 a lot easier and the tier 3 it removes the barracks requirement so in my head th this is telling me that oh well they might be able to tech up quicker which again like I say with their desire to skip well not, not necessarily skip tier 2 but kind of like spend as little time in tier 2 as possible to get that killing blur in tier 3, sir. I think that's a big buff for them. Uh, the second point that I want to make is that their vows have a reduced cost from 150 requisition to 100, but their vows now require tier 2 instead of tier 1. And that the Abhor the Witch, or Destroy the Witch, now disables all abilities, not just from some psychers. So that is interesting, sir. The Black Templar have a bunch of vows that they can take. Which basically gives them like like a faction wide kind of buff for their units, and quite you would very rarely see the abhor the witch or destroy the witch mainly because it only went against psychers. But with it being more general around uh, disabling abilities, I mean I think that that's that's great, you know, because uh, there's lots of factions that don't necessarily have psychers have really strong abilities, so that makes it less of a niche vow and more of a general purpose vow, which I I, I quite like, and. While it might seem like a nerf to take it from tier 1 to tier 2, um, I think that makes sense. Like, let's say, for example, you're a Black Templar player and you're going up against a Chaos Space Marine player. I mean, I've had a, lot, a lot of factions don't have many tier 1 uh, abilities for the commanders. Some do, like the Eldar, with their Mind Warp and their Guide and all that stuff. But the, the main ones, especially in tier 2 when you're going up, going up against Chaos, is those Chains of Torments. Those abilities that slow down or root your players. Now, Black Templar, they're very keen on getting involved in close combat with the Crusaders and the Command Squad and all, all that stuff. So, stuff like that is a real pain in the backside. But if you're able to negate that with your vows, that's pretty darn good, do you have to say. Now, the third thing I want to mention is they've got a new unit. I'm trying to avoid talking about new units in this game, or in, in this, uh, how do I want to say, in this patch notes, mainly because the new units, we can't quite tell how they're going to play out uh, in the meta or, or even in the short term because well, I, I just I don't have the experience of knowing about them. So I'm, I'm trying to keep it to the things that I know, if that makes any sense. But the Tempest Land Speeder, uh, similar to the Space Marine aircraft, uh, but instead of choosing the missile type it gets to upgrade, it comes with crack missiles enabled by default, which is quite good, quite good, because the Black Templar, especially in Tier 2, I mean, yeah, okay, you've got your command squad that can get the missile launchers, and they're quite decent against vehicles, 
But realistically, do you want your higher tier uh, units that are specifically good at punching people in the face to be on uh, vehicle duty? You don't really, but with the Tempest Land Speeder uh, for the Black Templars, that should hopefully um, mitigate some of that dependency on the Command Squad and the Crusader Fire Support Squad in taking out vehicles. And maybe, okay, well, you know what? I've got one or two Land Speeders. They can... Uh, take out the vehicles while my main boys go around purging Xenos as the God Emperor intended. So I quite, I, I quite like these changes. These changes, in my opinion, will hopefully make the Black Templar because you don't see many people play Black Templar uh, unless they have to, and hopefully this will make them a little bit more popular in the long run. So Chaos Demons are. I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to repeat myself several times. I'm going to say that all the changes are interesting, but you know, just just bear with me here. I have been drinking while writing this and also talking. So, yeah, so the first one, uh, the first big change is that they increase the uh, pop cap or the pop gained from the less demon portals and the greater demon portals from 4 to 6 and 4 to 5. Quite often you'll see, if you, if you watch the channel before, uh, Chaos Demons, they end up in a situation where they... Oh, how... It's, it's, like, it's like Sim City, but Chaos version, where they end up with these like, large sprawling bases which don't make really much sense for a bunch of entities that don't have much pull in the physical realm. So being able to build less, but being able to host more units, should one be able to allow the demons to spend more money on the actual units themselves, while being able to keep their bases nice and compact, so not occupy as much space. So I quite like that. Uh, for number two, we've got Nerglings. Well, actually, actually, a lot of the Chaos Demons have had their individual uh, lesser demons being altered in some way, shape, or form. The Neglings are quite like because they've added a slow effect on the hit and have lowered the rot or raw aura effect to compensate for the new slur. So they've they've essentially Neglings quite often you would not see them ever being being selected really, apart from the most dire circumstances, because they go in and they die. But let's say for example you combine Neglings with some blue horrors, or you could buy Nerglings with some corn people and to punch people in the face. So they've become like the, the best friends of a lot of the other uh, Chaos Demons. They basically sneak in, slap someone on the backside, and say, right, okay, you're not escaping, whatever damage is incoming. So yeah, they've got, they've got like an actual use now. Rather than being cannon fodder, they now provide a kind of slur, which is quite neat. And the third change, it's quite a simple one. All great demons require a relic, which makes sense, right? If, if the Chaos Space Marines require a relic to get a Blood Fester out, then surely the Chaos Demons also require one to get all their big stuff out. So hopefully that will I'll, uh, encourage Chaos Demon players to, rather than rush to get the big boys out later on in the game, to play around with their Tier 1s and Tier 2s and see whatever uh, build orders they can go for, which is quite nice. For the Chaos Space Marines, this is quite an unexpected one. Uh, the aspiring champion for cultists and Chaos Space Marines have their tier 2 requirement removed, which is interesting. So in tier 1, they've got access to their, well, their, obviously the sergeants or the aspiring champion equivalent. And yeah, so in their armory, where they're able to recruit or re research, sorry, their plasma pistols and their power weapons, uh, that'll give their tier 1 units a little bit of an extra boost. Uh, a lot of people kind of poo poo the. Uh, those kinds of sergeant and sparring champion upgrades, but it does really make a difference, uh, especially if play people are playing with small squads rather than reinforcing them to the maximum number. Um, yeah, it, it just it, I, I quite like that. It also makes them a little bit more different from the Space Marines, and I think that the more di well, I, I like the idea that Chaos Space Marines and Space Marines are quite similar in a lot of ways, but the more slight differences we can make between Space Marines and Chaos Space Marines is it, all, all good for the thematics, in my honest, humble opinion. Now, the biggest thing for the Chaos Space Marines is the changes to the Vindicator. Almost every single video that I've casted with Chaos Space Marines, Tier 2 happens, they go for a Vindicator. Mainly because it fires a bomb, it explodes, does lots of damage, and it just keeps on spouting out damage all day long. But what they've done here is that they've essentially reduce the firing rate significantly and increase the cost of the Vindicator from 165 requisition and 110 power to 165 requisition and 250 power. 
So, they'll be firing a lot less. They haven't reduced the damage for it, so take note of that. It'll still do the same amount of damage, but it won't be firing as often, and it's a lot more expensive to lose. So it's not the case of, oh, I'm going to build a Vindicator, shove it in the front lines, and if it dies, I'll just build a new one. No, that's not quite the case. You've got to make sure that you're protecting it, looking after it, and ensuring that when it does fire, at a much more reduced firing rate, it's getting the right targets. So a little bit more micro, a little bit more uh, concentration required to make the Vindicator more value for its money, which is, I think is if the, the Donald War community can now breathe a sigh of relief. It's all safe from the Chaos Space Marines Vindicator. And lastly, in the, same, in the same kind of vein of the Vindicator, you see the Iconoclasts quite a lot. Um, it, they're just like the staple. You know, you go Vindicators, you go Iconoclasts, um, maybe you also go Havocs as well. Combine those three together uh, with the Fawn, the, uh, or what's it called? Princess Fawn? Fawn of Princesses? So whatever. Whatever the anime girl's called, you go for her as well. And that's the winning combination. What they've done with these guys and gals is that they now require a Sacrificial Cycle. The pop cost is now two to three. Now they've increased the cost. Well, they, don't, they don't mention it for, from what to what. It's they say from 200 rec and 60 power to I don't know whether that's a missing piece of information. I don't know. And they've increased the reinforcement cost from 50 requisition and five power to 200 requisition and 60 power, which I mean, Jesus Christ, that is bloody redonkulous. That that is remarkable increase in, in reinforcement costs. So, much over the Vindicator, you can't exactly just spam these people out. You've got to really make sure that if you plan to use them, they're going to, I don't know, make an impact. Because if you reinforce them to maximum amount of, of people inside the squad, and send them forward, and get squad wipe, well, that's like potentially just like a whole bunch of money that you're just thrown away. So, uh, so, so a slight buff in, in some regards, but I think, I think a, a good balance, especially in that Vindicator uh, department for the Chaos Space Marines. So now for the Demon Hunters. Now, you'll notice if you, if you watch the channel quite a lot that the Demon Hunters have essentially got two tech maps. You can either go more human or no, or more, shall I say, uh, Stormtrooper kind of orientated, Inquisitor kind of uh, tech path, or you can go Grey Knights. And there's a reason why on the thumbnails for the Demon Hunters, I primarily, well, I, I exclusively use the Grey Knights as a model, mainly because most people, nine times out of ten, go for the Grey Knight uh, build order. But what they've done is that they've nerfed quite a lot of uh, Grey Knight units. So the example I'm going to give here for the first point is the Pegatas. They've had their range damage and melee default weapon reduced by 5%. Uh, they've reduced the morale of the melee weapon special attack from 40 to 10, and they've reduced the special attack damage by, by, and, and the Pegata just because by a bunch of stuff. There, there's essentially a whole bunch of stuff. Even the uh, Justicar has now had health reduced from 1,200 to 950. So a general uh, debuff for, for a fair few uh, Grey Knight uh, models, which, that being said, it might sound like, oh, well, now we're going to be rubbish. They were already remarkably strong. So even with a bit of a debuff, they are still going to be holding toe-to-toe -to -toe for a lot of units. I don't think it's a mega change in the Demon Hunters. It just makes the Stormtroopers uh, side of things a little bit more appealing, I would say. And one thing to uh, circumvent that is that for the second point, the Grey Knight Terminator squad has now been moved from Tier 4 to Tier 3. So rather than having to quickly tech up, as the uh, Demon Hunters tend to do, to get their big bad units, you can be a little bit more relaxed. You can, you can kind of get those bigger badder units out a little bit earlier. So even though their earlier units... Are a little bit weaker. Uh, the late tier units are now available a lot more earlier. So that should, again, not necessarily change much of the early game for them in that regard, but it should make them appealing for the later stages. Because from what I can understand in my head, and I could be wrong about this, but the idea is that the Stormtrooper variants of the Demon Hunters, they are, you know, quite numerous in tier one. And then as the game goes on, they fall off a little bit in the later stages. Whereas the Grey Knights, they lack the numbers in Tier 1. As the game goes on, they're a little bit stronger. So you've got the best of both worlds in that. And just to round this off, the third point, the Stormtroopers, their reinforcement cost is reduced from 35 requisition to 30. They've had an increased range to melt to weapons. Their grenade launchers now have knockback. So their grenade launchers are now on par with the Imperial Guard factions. 
And the metal guns receive extra damage properly from targeteers. So, yeah, so stop, like, like it, it's almost the inverse of the Pegasus. The Pegasus have a little bit of a, no, of a nerf. The Stormtroopers have a little bit of a buff. So hopefully we will be seeing some Demon Hunters games where the Stormtrooper path is being picked a little bit more frequently. So Dark Angels, right? They are famous in unification for having some of the strongest capping units in the game. Uh, their scouts come out. They had snipers and shotguns, and they just basically decimate people. And that was that was it, really. And then you would you would never ever go for your regular space marines. Uh, you might get company master, but essentially it's just scouts until tier two. Morris dreadnought or whatever you would go for. Maybe you go for a quick tier three as well. But so what they've done is that they've decreased the population cost from 150 requisition to 130, so they made them a little bit cheaper, but they've also made them a little bit weaker. So it's not necessarily a, I don't know, I, I, I suppose that is a bit of a debuff in the sense that, uh, I mean, 10% is quite a lot, and their sniper rifles now have a setup time. So rather than sneaking around and just 360 no-scoping people at the part of of uh, FaZe Clan, they are, yeah, they're, they're, they're going to be a little bit more slower and do a lot less damage, so... Maybe that might encourage Dark Angels players to go for less scouts and maybe give the regular old Space Marine unit a try. But I, I, I don't know. I, I think the scout meta is ingrained in the Dark Angels quite significantly. And even though the sniper rifles require setup time, it still doesn't affect that fact that they just will do a lot of damage. It's lightly armored infantry. Although maybe that will then allow factions with uh, Raptors, uh, Tau Commander when he jumps over... People who can get right close and personal and shoot them up good and proper or smash them up good and proper. Uh, I, I assume that that is probably what the idea is there. So the second point that I want to make is that even though the uh, Dark Angels are famously known for having some of the best scouts in the game, they do have some of the worst Razorbacks in the game. So this second point is basically just rectifying that uh, in some way. So the Multi-Melter has been removed from Tier 3 and now uh, is in Tier 2. So they've got a lot more options for uh, their weaponry in tier two. Although the multi melter does require an armory, it's got a reduced multi mel. Uh, so it's got a reduced firing rate, and the uh, last cannon secrets, the inner circle requirements, has been removed while also increasing the damage by fifty percent. Although that is now in tier three, so it's not it's not a major change. And I'd still think that the Razorback probably lacks the punch that the Imperial fists have and that the salamanders have but it at least gives them a little bit of an option you know they're, they're not a, a massive wet lettuce when it comes uh into tier two they will be able to go and in fact even maybe if you're going up against the imperial fists as a dark angels player or some other faction that's got like a really strong tier two uh, vehicular uh element to them uh you can now rely on your razorbacks you know you've got if you've spent a lot of money on your scouts and you don't have that much option for anti-vehicle stuff the Razorback can kind of cover your back there, which I quite like. And then the third one, which which is phenomenal, Asmodai has been reduced from 400 rec and 400 power to 400 rec and 200 power. So the Dark Angels have got lots and lots of heroes in their roster. And quite a common thing, actually, for a lot of Space Marine factions is that they've got quite a strong uh, focus on what their heroes can do. I mean, obviously, they're, they're bloody Space Marine heroes. You know, they've been around for quite a while. They smash people. It's all good. And generally, from what I can tell, I mean, it's not just for Asmodai, but it's for a lot of other heroes in the Dark Angels section. They've been made more accessible. They've been easy to get. Uh, that it's, it's not necessarily that they've been buffed or debuffed or anything like that. It just, I think, I think with all the changes that we've seen for Asmodai and the boys, uh, I hope that we'll see them a lot more. Because I mean, if if the, I mean, especially like if you put a lot of effort into including all those heroes into the game and you don't see them very often, it would make sense to uh, balance them in a way that you would find them more viable to have on the battlefield. So excellent stuff from the perspective of the Dark Eldar. Not the Dark Eldar? Aha! The Dark Angels! Bit of heresy there for you. So Dark Eldar, unification. Build order, pretty simple in the previous patch. Build your warriors, you get your Shredder Rifles, kill the enemy, but don't get the killing blow. Gain tier 2 and 3, fill up your bigger units, and then get the killing blow that way. Quite similar to the uh, Black Templar in that regard. But what they've done is that they've kind of... Uh, the, the team have kind of like re redone how the Warriors have their Shredder Rifles. So essentially the Warriors, for the first point I want to make, is that they've had their Shredder Rifles 
accuracy reduced. And they've also had the accuracy reduced while on the move. So, quite a lot of times you would see in games, Dark Elder Warriors would go straight away for the Shredder Rifles. And they would basically chase people around while shooting them to death. So the idea that they reduce the accuracy and also the accuracy on being on the move should... While they're not changing the damage value of the Shredder Rifles, they're still going to do a lot of damage, but they are going to be hitting a lot less. So that's... That, I mean, I, I suppose that is a, a reduction in the DPS, but hopefully that will uh, encourage Dark Eldar players to maybe not be so reliant on the Shredder Rifles, or at least... While they still might be still quite strong, it won't be that, oh my goodness, I'm up against Dark Elder. They've gone Shredder Rifles. All my heavy infantry is now dead straight away. It'll give you some reaction time to maybe retreat or maybe get some upgrades for your units. Maybe also reinforce some units in the middle of a battle so they won't die as quickly so you don't get necessarily a squad wipe too bad. So, yeah, okay. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, number two, the Grotesques. Quite often you see Grotesques they come out, they've got a million HP, they've got a million health regeneration, they go into a battle, they slap things around, and they just stay there forever. They've got their health reduced by 200, and they've also had the health regen reduced from 5 to 3. So, it just makes them a lot less tankier. So, that that way, kind of like the Warriors, that they're, they're probably still going to uh, still fulfil their role, in the sense of the Warriors, the DPS, the Grotesques, go into the middle of things, and just be a nuisance. But they're going to be less so. They're going to be less oppressive for other players. And then the third one, uh, we've, we've seen on the channel quite a few times, Monstrous Chimera's coming out, and it's basically running absolutely amok. They come forward, they slap down buildings, they slap down important vehicles, and because they're so swift, uh, they're really difficult to deal with. But what they've done is that they've reduced the health regen from 6 to 4, they've now only got a limit of 1, and you also require Warp Beasts on the field first. So... That's interesting, because what beasts... I mean, the, the what beasts are a very good unit. But quite often you would see Eldar players say, right, you know what, I don't need what beasts, because I've got, I've got the, the, the big uh, mummy one to come out. But forcing a player to go for what beasts first, that kind of makes the monstrous chimera a little bit more expensive, because you've got to invest in what beasts first, then make sure they don't die, because, there's, I mean, there's no point in building one unit than not using it. So you're going to send it to combat anyway. So, yeah, it, it, it makes it a lot less accessible, which will still... still. I mean, there's no, there's no reduction to damage. Again, there's, it's still viable for the role it's meant to be. You run forward with a lot of speed and slap things down very quickly. It's just that you've got less options to do that. So Dark Eldar players seen quite a bit of a, a debuff in this patch, but they were quite strong in the previous one. So I suppose it's all swings and roundabouts, isn't it? Now, the Death Guard are certainly a faction that a lot of people have been calling the nerfs for, for quite some time. Uh, just because they're so bloody strong. And they, they've certainly delivered a fair few nerfs for the Death Guard in this iteration of unification. So first and foremost, Nagel Cultists. Quite often, we see them coming out and against scouts and lightly armoured capping units. They would go forth with the shotguns, blast them to death, and then cap their points. But what they've done here is that they've increased their build cost from 90 requisition to 105. They've reduced the range damage to infantry by 25% and also to commanders by 10% as well. So they're going to be a, a lot less oppressive. They're going to feel a lot more like a capping unit rather than a big damage dealer unit, which makes sense because capping units... Well, I suppose some capping units are meant to be uh, big juggernauts for some factions, but the Death Guard, the cultists, man, they're meant to be a little bit weedy. Uh, I mean, st they've still got all the health and still got a little bit of their resistances and whatnot, but yeah, they're not meant to be this blooming gunslinging Stephen King from the from the Dark Tower, <laughs> single-handedly wielding a shotgun in one hand nonsense, but yeah, cool. Uh, the next one as well is that the Plague Havocs. So, interesting. I've never said interesting before, but this is, I would say, quite interesting. So they've increased the reinforcement cost from 65... Uh, requisition and zero power, 65 rec and 5 power, which uh, whenever a unit has got power uh, reinforcement cost, it does reduce your ability to transition from infantry to vehicles. And uh, we see it quite a lot of Sisters of Battle when they build a lot of uh, Celestians, oh sorry, no, not Celestians, Seraphins in Tier 1. 
Uh, Surfins, from what I can remember, I mean, this is vanilla numbers, I think. It's 50 blue and 5 green. So even though you, spam, you can spam them out quite early, if you don't have a strong power base, you can't reinforce them. And that's going to be the same for the Death Guard. If you don't have a strong power base, then your Plague Havocs are going to die pretty quickly. But one thing I found quite interesting is that they've reduced the squad price from 240 requisition and 60 power to 140 requisition and 20 power until the research putrid missiles is done. So, interesting. They've increased the reinforcement cost, but they've decreased the actual squad price until they get the putrid missile um, research done. So, if, if you're not in the nerve, essentially, the Plague Havocs, they all come out of missile launchers, they deal damage against vehicles. But then, when they get the putrid missile upgrade, they can then do a lot of damage against infantry. So what they've done is that for them to be good against infantry and vehicles, they now cost a lot of money. But then when you first build them, the, the, I mean, they're remarkably cheap. I mean, 140 requisition on 20 per and 20 purple. Uh, sorry, 20 power. Well, just just to bring it back to the Negro cultists, what now cost 150 requisition and zero power. I mean, they're not that much more expensive considering that they're a tier two unit. They're not that much more expensive. Nagel cultists. So is the plan to for now Death Guard players to buy your two Plague Havoc squads when they're cheap, then research putrid missiles, so now you've got the same value but uh, start a cheaper value. But don't get me wrong, the damage increase for the range DPS upgrades is reduced from 1.5 to 1.1 but, I mean like, I don't know I don't know if they've accidentally buffed the Plague Havocs. I could be wrong here. There might be something that I'm missing, but this looks to me like if you're a wily Death Guard player. I mean, I suppose that if you get a squad wipe on the Plague Havocs, they've got to rebuild them, and they're quite expensive. But not not ridiculously expensive. Not so much that you, you'd turn your nose about them. It's the 60 power, I think, that'll, that'll do most players in if they want to go for upgrades. And I suppose that having to, if you have to reinforce them, or have to, sorry, have to rebuy them, that that 60 power is going to take your tier 3 down a notch. It will delay your tier 3 by a significant margin. So, yeah, I, I don't know that mixed bag on that one. I'll have to wait and see how that affects. But get get Focus. Focus is, is, a, is a loyal Death Guard player. We'll have to see how he deals with these changes. And then the third one, Mortarion. Quite often we've seen him in games. They've now added a critical location to his requirements. And he no longer shares a cap with relic units. So oh, it's also his cost increased as well. As well as changing his population cost from vehicle. Of sort of eight vehicle. To five infantry population. So that makes sense. I like the idea that he's not involved in the vehicle population. And also his vehicle. Oh, sorry, and that his population has been reduced from eight to five. So that way he's not taking up your other relic units so you might be able to get Mortarian and like a or what whatever you call the Plague Land Raid it might even be called the Plague Land Raid I can't quite remember off the top of my head so yeah you can get Mortarian on the side of your other uh, relic units but the fact that you've, you've got to get a critical location for it means that you've got to have that map control you can't just spawn a Mortarian out of your ass and say right, okay well now now I've won because I've now got a Primark what are you going to do about it so yeah, so it's it's a general debuff for the Death Guard, and hopefully that will that will keep them in line with other factions potentially. So Death Guard Creek, much like the Death Guard, have been another faction that people have been calling for uh, debuffs for quite some time, and I, I think they've they've, they've made a, a fairly decent uh, dint in their especially their early game and their tier two uh, power. So for the first major uh, change, I would say is that their bunker has been nerfed. It's got a decrease, uh, sorry, a, a, a decreased suppression effect, 8%, 6%. It's got a increased build time, increased cost, uh, slow reduction, uh, reduced range. So gen generally, like, like, uh, like, yeah, it's generally been uh, nerfed across the board. So hopefully the Death Guard, when they place a bunker down, it's not going to be uh, quite a lot of the situations where you see Death Car player. Okay, this land is mine. I've put a bunker on it now. You've now got to ignore it until you get into tier 2 and you've got some anti-building uh, weaponry. 
And so for the second point for the Heavy Weapons Platoon, they have reduced the building cost for them from 213 requisition to 50 power to 200 requisition and 30 power, but they've increased the initial build time from 30 seconds to 40 seconds. And what they've done is that they've also increased the reinforcement cost for Heavy Bolters, also cannons and las cannons so while they are initially cheaper to get their actual big bad weaponry that you know is what they usually do to have these game changing effects uh it's 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 a general uh debuff in regards to uh, how much money that they cost and the, their reinforcement time has also increased from 15 seconds to 30 seconds which is i mean so it's not the case of what happened would sometime when a player would invade a death car base and they think, oh shit, I've got, no, I've got no units. Quickly, let me just spam out a bunch of heavy weapons platoons and then survive this. Now, if you don't have those units already on the field, already reinforced, it'll take them a lot of time and a lot of money to get in there. They've also increased the space that they take up in transports from one to two. So that way you can't pack a Chimera with two, or oh, should, should I say a whole bunch of Heavy weapons platoons and move them around the battlefield. It's, it's going to be a lot, a lot less maneuverability for the heavy weapons, which in theory should make them a lot less of a pain in the backside for other factions to deal with. And one thing as well is that they've kind of made the Storm Chimeras a little bit more like the other uh, Imperial Guard factions. They've increased the cost from 100 requisition and 70 power to 120 and 70 power. They've normalized multi laser uh, DPS. Increase population from 1 to 2, and increase the limit from 3 to 6. So you can get more of them, but they are going to cost you more pop uh, population uh, cost. So it can't be the case anymore where you've got your high-tier vehicles on the field and also a legion of storm chimeras. It's going to be a case of, oh, well, you can have maybe, maybe one or two and then get some artillery, maybe get some Ragnaroks out there, or you can just basically dedicate your entire force storm chimeras. Which again, like, I mean, you can, you can still put your heavy weapons platoons inside them. It's going to be a lot less effective than it was before. In regards to the Eldar, so they, they've had a fair few changes to a lot of their Phoenix Lords, a lot of their heroes. Uh, I mean, they've got a fair few, to be fair, that you can summon from the web where get. Uh, a lot of times on the channel, we've seen uh, Phoenix Lord Morgan Ra, or Morgan Ra? However one pronounces his name. Essentially, comes to the battlefield, he's a big chunky boy, kills everything when he joins a Dark Reaper squad. So what they've done is that they've taken a big chunk of his health off to make him more vulnerable. They've also reduced his damage to infantry, heavy infantry commanders and demons by 50%. And they've standardized his armor value to 100. So he still gives his buff to other Dark Reapers. It's just that he himself does a lot less damage. So, he's, so he, he plays... I mean, he'll still do a lot of damage. But that's not, uh, don't get me wrong there. But he, he'll now... I think he'll now, rather than coming out, rocking out with his cock out, riding solo, slaying people, he'll now be dependent on working with the, a squad of Dark Reapers and attaching himself to them to be quite efficient. Uh, Fel Farsia Aldrad, the big dad himself, has moved from tier 1 to tier 3. He has now also changed a critical location requirement to a relic requirement. So he's now effectively a relic unit. And he's basically, uh, he's, he's got a... He's, uh, shared limit of other Farseers, that's been removed, and he's also had his, imp he's also had his stats improved as well, so, so essentially he, he is basically the big bad Eldrad himself, uh, which which makes sense, you know, I mean, he's, he's a very important character in the Warhammer lore, and so to have him as a tier 1, because uh, it's kind of like, uh, what, who, who are they, the Thousand Sons, when you get Araman, uh, he's in tier 3, oh, he's in the later tiers, he's got a bunch of spells, so, so they've kind of put Farsi and Eldrad on the same level as, as those kinds of heroes, where you can't get them until later on, but when you get them out, they're a lot more effective, which I quite like. And the third one, this this is a, this is a bias. This, this is this might not be the most interesting for everyone, but for me personally, you know, I, I want to see the Banshees being a more viable unit in, uh, in, in Tier 1, just because I'm sick and tired of seeing Double Dark Reapers opening. But Banshees having their special attack removed, so hopefully that should help them keep up with the people that they're chasing after. It will slice out the heels a little bit more and increase DPS from the Exarch slightly. So, I don't know if these changes are going to be enough to see more Banshees on the field. But, I mean, we can... All we could do is hope and pray, boys and girls. I, I, I want to see more Banshees uh, being played 
in the game because that'd be cool. Now, the Emperor's Children, this is another faction that everyone was screaming uh, to have uh, some debuffs being placed on them because they're just ridiculously strong. We've seen in a couple of tournaments how the Emperor's Children just walk up and they've got the one build order, which is take them into tier two, build warp talons, win. Right, that's that essentially uh, how it boiled down in a lot of games. So the warp talons have been affected by quite a significant uh, debuff. So they've had an increased reinforcement cost from 60 requisition and zero to 60 requisition and 10 power. So that means that they're going to be a little bit more expensive. Again, with the point that I made about the Celestians earlier on, if you have a power requirement, it's going to delay your tier three. And quite a lot of times you see the Warp Sons come out in tier two, they do a lot of damage, then Empress Children get to tier three, they get their Terminators and their Sonic Predators, and then they get the killing blur through those units. So having the Warp Talons cost a lot more in the power department should delay that tier 3. And they've also had the health reduction of their models from 700 to 65. And they've also had a reduction for their building damage for medium and high by 50%. So I'm going to walk to your base and slap down your high value building straight away. So fingers crossed that should at least tame the Warp Talons just, just a smidgen. For the second point, the combat drugs. They have had a decrease in duration by 5% and 10%. So if you're not in the uh, combat drugs, essentially, you pop them and you can't be reduced below one hit point. So it basically makes you a little bit more old for a, a little while. So reducing that will increase the fragility. Is that the word? Yeah, the, the, uh, the fragility of the Empress children, which makes sense. If, if you're going to have low health units, give them the combat drugs, so it gives them a little bit of durability, but it's very, very micro-dependent. I don't know if the 5% and 10% is going to be a major game-changer, but it's it's something. It'll make, them, it'll make them more fragile, which is exactly what we want for Empress Children. And the third point, it's not necessarily a big point, but uh, the Lesser Demonettes, they've had their limit of two being removed, which is quite nice. I know that if you subscribe to the... Oh, what's his name? Blooming uh, Fabulous Bile's Ways of Thinking, where demons don't exist. <laughs> if you've not read the uh, Fabulous Bile trilogy, I highly recommend it. It's the best trilogy of uh, all time, apart from Lord of the Rings, of course. But it, it's, it's an amazing series of books, and he just says, no, demons, be gone. But for a lot of Empress Children people, demonettes are a huge vibe, and the fact that I can now build more of them uh, will hopefully try and, try and maybe encourage players to go for more demon-y kind of thing, because essentially every time you see Empress Children play, it's you build a couple of Noise Marines, a couple of Warp Talons, Terminators, it's very human-orientated. They've got lots of demon-y stuff that they could make use of, so hopefully we'll see more demonets on the battlefield with this change. Now, the Harlequins is a difficult one, and that's primarily because I think in the grand total of the, of the 210 games I've casted, I think four of them about four of them have been Harlequins. They're not a popular faction at all. At least I don't see them very often being sent into the channel. But they've got a couple of changes. Uh, one of their major uh, changes is that the jet bikes have had uh, the max count of jumps uh, reduced from two to one. They've had their health regen uh, removed. And they've had a health reduction from 450 to 375. Uh, from what I understand, Harlequins, the jet bike opening is quite strong. Because before they had the health regen, you could go in, attack a bunch of stuff, fall back, let it regen, and then come back in and do some more damage. So kind of like the Dark Eldar, uh, Reaver Jet Bike harassment, but just on bloody steroids. So fingers crossed that is going to make the Harlequins Jet Bikes opening a lot less oppressive to other players. Uh, the troops have had a grenade rework. It removes the disable and blind chance from the grenade and made them 100% chance to reduce movement speed and increase melee damage taken. So the troops... Uh, are Quite a, quite a common problem with a lot of melee squads is that someone runs away from them and it gets quite a lot of damage. If you throw a grenade and it has a definite chance of reducing movement speed and also increases melee damage taken, it will give the troops a little bit more of an option to get involved in nitty-gritty of close combat and make some uh, real changes on how the uh, engagements are played out. They also have decap as well, so they can do a little bit of uh, point harassment as well. They've now got a reduced build time by about 10 seconds. So they should be able to get on the battlefield a lot quicker. Uh, sometimes, in fact, from the games that I, do, that I see, 
Troops are normally used in tier 2, uh, especially after they get their jumpy upgrade. But maybe now that they can decap, maybe now that they can throw grenades at people, they might have some value and use in the early stages of the game. And the third one, Death Jesters. Essentially, from what I've seen, they come out and they murder things. They come out and score a 1 at the beginning, and then they get 3 Death Jesters in there. So that Shrieker shots now require a full squad of 3 Death Jesters to use. And they can also now decap, so kind of similar to the Death Troops, they can do decapping nonsense. But it does require a full squad of Death Jesters to do a bit of damage. That's good in the sense that, again, kind of like what I mentioned earlier on about another faction, uh, the Death Guard Krieg, where, oh my goodness, I'm being invaded, quick, get the Death Jesters out just to delete everything in front of me. No, it requires a fully fledged squad of three Death Jesters to get those Shriek of Shots out, so very good stuff. So Imperial Fist, they had a change to their listing posts. The last cannon damage has been reduced against infantry and commanders by about 30%, which makes sense because last cannons are anti-vehicle weapons, and the fact that they were so good against infantry commanders uh, makes no sense. But then, it, it, so it, it makes them still viable or still quite strong in tier two and tier three when they are uh, defending against vehicles. It also gives the Imperial Fist like a, like a minor moment of weakness in the early tiers will focus, or at least it should force the Imperial Fist to play a little bit more defensive to protect those listening posts until they're a little bit more viable in Tier 2. So, yeah, quite a, quite, a, quite like that emphasis on trying to force a Imperial Fist player. I think, anyway, this is my interpretation of this change. Maybe play a bit more defensively to protect their listening posts rather than just leaving them to shoot a bajillion million things with the last cannons. For well, the Siege Marines, uh, the second point that I want to make is that they've uh, changed their armor type from Infantry Heavy High to Infantry Heavy Medium, uh, which makes them a little bit more vulnerable. Which, I suppose, when you're carrying on heavy cover with you all day long, uh, I mean, they're already quite tanky, so reducing their uh, armor is, is, is a good idea. Uh, they've also increased the cover aura, aura radius by 25%, so while they're less defensible. I mean, they're easy to kill now that they've got a lower armor type. But they also provide a, a bigger support uh, bonus by, by increasing their uh, heavy cover aura for them, which is quite nice. They've also had their uh, DPS and armor pen values for the flamer weapons normalized. So sometimes you would see siege marines come out, they've got the flamers, and they burn everything to a crisp while also being invulnerable to ranged fire unless, you know, I mean, someone comes along that's slapping them in close combat. But yeah, so they, they've, they've, it seems that they've been nerfed a bit just to make sure that their primary role isn't being the frontline troop, but being a support troop of making sure that other space marines are able to survive more rather than siege marines themselves being the DPS uh, unit. And here's an interesting one for the uh, space marine squad. So what they've done is that they've increased the cost of the tank hunter ability from 80 power to 90. Uh, this is the ability that the Space Marine squad has where they are able to swap out all the weapons the missile launchers and any vehicle in front of them is basically dead after a couple of volleys. So they've increased the power cost of that for a little bit. So not a major debuff, but just enough to maybe uh, reduce the frequency in which the tank hunter abilities have been uh, uh, used. And they've also increased the fire on the move accuracy of the bolters from 10% to 15% while also reducing the standing accuracy of the bolters from 75% to 60. So this seems to me that they're trying to encourage the Space Marine squads for the Imperial Fists to be a little bit more mobile, which I don't know if that's thematic, considering that the Imperial Fists are the basic I build defences, I stand still, I shoot people and defend my little sandcastle, whatever the cost may be. But they are, hmm, how would one say, they probably do want a little bit more fire on the move, just because I mean, you know, if you want to play offensive with the Imperial Fists it's quite difficult, considering that they, they do want to play defensively, naturally as, as we would expect, but being able to let them fire on the move a little bit more while also reducing their stunning accuracy will maybe motivate a few people to be a little bit more aggressive quite often you'll see players with defensive factions, will sit and play defensive until the opponents have out them and out economied them and then they just basically die so, yeah, encouraging for offensive stuff is always welcome, in my honest, humble opinion. So, for the Imperial Guard, a lot of their main points are, well, I should, should say all three of their main points are focused around 
the vehicles that they have. So first point is that the Chimera has had its support cost increased from 1 to 2. Uh, its increased accuracy of the multi-laser has now gone from 50% to 75%, but the raw damage has been reduced and has also reduced the penetration of the whole mounted heavy bolter against vehicles, buildings, and aircraft by 75%. So, a massive reduction in their damage in regards to the uh, damage they can output towards other vehicles. Which makes sense because Chimeras aren't, aren't designed to be uh, uh, slapping down other vehicles. They're meant to be carrying a bunch of Imperial Guardsmen around. And they're the ones that are meant to be doing damage. Or at least providing some sort of support in the back lines. Providing some additional armor and stuff like that. So, it's, it's not a major debuff, I would say. But I do think that the support cap increase from 1 to 2 is probably the most uh, significant change for them. Uh, much like the... Oh, was it Defcor that had this thing to them? I can't remember now. This video has taken me a while to, to, to record. But it, it's going to force the Imperial Guard to spam the Chimeras a lot less. But, I mean, squad cap of 2 isn't, isn't terrible uh, for a vehicle as versatile as a Chimera. Uh, second point, the Sentinel has had its costs reduced from... 150 requisition, 150 per, uh, purple. Ah, uh, no. Keep on making that mistake. 150 power to 150 requisition and 120 power. So a lot cheaper now. Uh, they've also had a reduction of the cost for the auto cannon upgrade from 50 requisition and 35 power to 50 requisition and 25 power. So you don't need to go as hard on the green money to get the sentinels out, which is quite nice because if you're going for infantry heavy composition and you don't have that much spare green money on the GURP, you still maybe afford a couple of sentinels or two to uh, bolster your front lines. It's quite good. They've also reduced the cost of the multi-melter. They've also reduced its range. and But then that being said, it doesn't uh, require tactical control. And they've also reduced the last cannon upgrade to 50 requisition and 50 power. So they've certainly made the sentinel a lot more flexible in what you can uh, upgrade it with. So your front line of infantry... Uh, should be able to enjoy a few more Sentinels uh, when they're going about their wicked and foul business. And Lehman Russ, uh, essentially, a lot. The, the, the mainstay of that is that basically all the uh, side weapons have had a reduction cost. So, I mean, this this goes for the Conqueror, it goes for the Exit Terminator, the Eradicator, all that stuff. Essentially, it's just it's just cheaper to upgrade your Lehman Russ. So rather than, oh, well, I need to... You know, have the standard Lehman Russ or spend a lot of money on getting the higher tier Lehman Russes. There's now a bit more flexibility. So you should be able to have incinerators for Lehman Russes. I suppose that's because you've got the uh, other flame tank that they've they've got. But, I mean, it, with the reduced uh, cost and the increased health... Well, it's not increased, but uh, Lehman Russes have more health than... Uh, Wolf Banes, what are they called? Or am I getting my mods mixed up here? The other one, they've got a flame tank, but... I mean, the Lehman Russ is bigger and stronger. So stick a flamer on that, and maybe that's 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 what you need. But yeah, I like, I like it. More flexibility in Lehman Russes. That would make any Imperial Guardsman quite happy. Legion of the Damned. Much like the Harlequins, I have not seen that many games of them being played. They're not a very particularly popular faction uh, for a lot of the PvPers on the go. But they've had a couple of changes. Their first change, well, that's important for me, is that they can build a second portal in Tier 4. So what they used to be able to do was they were able to take their portal and teleport it somewhere else. But they've basically removed that ability and now they've replaced it with the idea of getting a second portal. So kind of like how Necrons work where you've only got one production building but in the later stage of the game you build a second production building so you're able to produce twice as many units in uh, the same amount of time which, which makes sense. I, I, I quite like that. It gives the Legion of the Damned some late tier uh, threat. Also, it means that they don't have to be so defensive on one portal. They can uh, build a, a, a second one somewhere else. So they don't have to exactly put all their eggs in one basket. Uh, second one, the builds now have detection, which is quite useful. If you've got a. If, I mean, it's Legion of the Damned up against something like Tau or maybe like another Space Marine opponent went very heavy on the stealth scout snipers. Yeah, quite difficult to detect them from the Legion of the Dam perspective. But again, I suppose they're, they're being a little bit more similar to the Necrons. Uh, their build is now detection. That would be too much of a problem for them. And the Legionnaires and Terminators. They've had their base morale increased by 5. 
And they've also increased the squad size and special weapons that are now tied to the weapon researchers. Uh, so not to the T, not to the tier level of the portal. So you are able to get your legionnaires and terminators a little bit more beefy, regardless of, of what state your portal is in. Which, so for Legion of Damned, we can't. We quite often saw them go for a bunch of bikes in tier one, skip straight to tier three, and go for like dreadnoughts or other uh, other units that they can they can get. And it's, it's just odd that you never see legionnaires because I mean they are the. If you think Legion of Damned, you think a Space Marine in flaming armor. But the fact that you never really saw them in the game uh, put a bit of a sour taste in my mouth. So I mean, maybe uh, this will help Legion of the Damned players justify uh, purchasing Legionnaires and uh, Terminators a bit more often. So Necrons have been a real pain in the backside for a lot of players when they hit tier 2.5. Necrons they play quite standard, uh, much like vanilla. Uh, when they're in tier 1. But the moment that they get their Greater Summoning Corps in tier 2, that is when the real fun starts. So for their first change, the Tomb Blade has had its costs increased from 200 power to 275 power. They've had their health reduced, their squad cap increased from 2 to 3, and their range reduced from 30 to 50. So massive debuff on the Tomb Blades there. It's quite often you would say, oh, okay, well, you know what? I've got a bunch of warriors. I'm now just going to get a couple of Tomb Blades and they're going to kill everything and win the game for me. So that should hopefully uh, reduce the absolute tenacity that the Tomb Blades have in the Necron roster and give give other players a bit of breathing room. Uh, second one is that the Pyramids have now been moved from Tier 2.5 to Tier 3. This is the building that you can stick your Necron Lord in to get the other bigger, badder, Necron Lords like Imatek and the other dudes. Uh, I mean, what's his name? The one of the Pokeball. Can't quite remember his name off the top of my head, but you, you know the one, the, the, the famous Necron Lord. He's, he's, he's in there somewhere. But yeah, so tier 3, that's uh, that's where they've been put. So that prevents the Necron players from from being so obnoxious with those guys. And on that note as well, the third point I want to make is Imatek, uh, the Storm Lord. Uh, he's got, he could just basically summon a storm. That's one of his abilities. And essentially, you pop that in the building, or you pop that in, a, in, a, in an enemy's base, and it just wipes out quite a lot of stuff. So what they've done is that the abilities DPS to the buildings have been reduced by 50%. So yeah, it's still going to be really, really good against infantry and other bits and bobs, but it's going to be less effective against buildings, which makes sense to me. You know, I mean, strike a person with lightning and they set on fire and die, but strike a building... I mean, lightning doesn't do that much build, uh, damage to buildings. I mean, this, this is me talking. I mean, I, I, I live in England. We don't have that many lightning storms. I could be wrong. Maybe in the favelas of distant lands, lightning is a dangerous thing. But no, not in England. Not in England, certainly, so. Yeah, so, so a, a general debuff to Necrons overall to make sure that their tier 2.5 isn't as just redonkulous as it has been in the past. So in regards to the Orcs, boys, I'm sad to say that the Decker Jet meta is probably over at this point. Uh, it's just had, had reductions all the way through, which which makes me so sad because Orcs being probably a main faction of me for quite some time, uh, I'm not very good at the game, and whenever I start losing, I just build Decker Jets and win. But no, you can't do that anymore, so they've had a reduction of the overall DPS by 10%. Uh, they've also had their health reduced from 2,500 to 2,000. Uh, their Vehicle damage, well, the damage against the vehicle low armor has been reduced by 50%. They've also had a range damage reduction and also weapon range damage. Oh, sorry, sorry, just a, a regular weapon range reduction by 5. So, they're just going to be a little bit worse. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's still going to be quite useful against infantry. They'll have to get a little bit closer. They'll be a little bit more vulnerable to counterattacks. But they can't exactly just, just turn up and just turn everything into mulch anymore. Which breaks my heart, man. Breaks my gosh darn heart. Uh, the second thing, uh, more on the Orc aircraft stuff, is that the Death Copters have had their maximum squad size reduced from 6 to 4. Uh, the overall volume... Of, oh, thank goodness. The overall volume of their sounds has been reduced, which is amazing. Saves my ears. And But they've also reduced the initial cost. 120 and 150 to 90 and 120. They've also reduced the reinforcement cost from 40 to and 50 to 30 and 40. And they've increased their building damage to by 50%. So they basically made them smaller, but they made them cheaper, and they've made them more specific to harass buildings. 
So they're giving them a specific focus here. It's base harassment. In tier 2, when there's some back and forth going on, uh, you can get your death copters, go around the flanks, and do some badness and sadness to the front line. So, I, I, I you know what? Death copters, I, I don't mind that. They've also increased the limit from 2 to 4. You'll able to get twice the amount of death copter squads on the battlefield at any one given time. So, if you want to go for that massive base trade, uh, death copters might be more, more, more of a viable option now. And the third one, stick bombers. We have never, ever, ever seen a stick bomber being used in a PvP situation. I mean, I've never even recruited a stick bomber. Uh, but I assume it's because they're rubbish. But now, uh, they throw grenades as a default weapon. And they've also overhauled the DPS around that of reducing squad size by one and increasing the cost of the models from 35 to 45. So I assume that the stick bombers are AoE damage orientated. Maybe quite good against light infantry and people in heavy cover and stuff like that. Uh, although I don't know if, if grenades have more or less damage in heavy cover or light cover. But you know what? I'm going to pretend that they do for reasons. So, yeah, I, we might see one stick bomber squad in a army composition sometime in the near future based on this. I don't know, though. I don't know. Depends on the range of the grenades. Depends on how much. Uh, it actually, it depends massively on the overhaul DPS around that and whether that's going to be deleting units or not. So Salamanders have had a few changes to their vehicles, uh, mainly the Thunderfire Cannon and the Rapier Armor Destroyer. So quite a common opening for the Salamanders is that you build an armory and you go Thunderfire Cannon and you kill stuff. Uh, what they've done is that they've changed the direct damage uh, to artillery projectiles and they've completely reworked the DPS for that. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that's a buff or a debuff. In my head, artillery projectile means that it's AoE damage Potentially, so maybe there's less individual damage against a model and more of a spread kind of stuff. So rather than sniping out individual models inside a unit, it does overall damage. So I don't know whether that that makes them better or worse, but it's it's something I suppose. And the rapier arm destroyer is that its pop cost changed from nothing to one, as was well increasing the cost from 100 requisition and 60 power to 120 requisition and 8 power. So you can't exactly just like one time you would see in because you, you get the rapier armor destroyers in tier 2 and the thunder fire cannons in tier 1 and I mean well, well, the thing about not having a vehicle pop is it, make, it just basically makes them free like like if, if you've got some spare requisition and power just buy some rapier armor destroyers because it's not actually going to affect uh, your, unit comp your unit composition at all but now that they've got that vehicle pop it might make salamander players think twice before just spamming out a bunch of rapier armor destroyers Especially now that they're also a little bit more expensive. So you can't exactly just send them into the front lines like we've seen sometimes on the channel. And let them die. You know, it, it, it's a, it's more, more of a risky proposition there. And the Salamanders, they've, they've got they've got quite a decent razor back. But it has now had the assault cannon weapon upgrade. Uh, had its DPS uh, decreased against vehicles, buildings and aircraft by 10 and 20%. Also had its health reduced from 2,600 to 2,200. So that means that the Razorback is uh, less of a general kind of vehicle. It's not going to be as effective against vehicles or building aircraft. It's still going to be quite good against infantry, but it's, it's primarily going to be orientated towards that stuff when upgrading with the Assault Cannon, which is probably the most common upgrade for the Razorback. And with its health reduction as well, it make it a little bit more vulnerable to uh, being out of position and anti-vehicle weaponry. So for the Space Marines, the first part I want to bring up is that the Honor Guard commanders like Chaplain and Librarians are now excluded from the free commander limit. The Space Marines are strong in the sense that they've got a lot of commanders. And those commanders basically walk down the battlefield and slap the crap out of most people. Which is, you know, again like what I mentioned about a previous Space Marine uh, faction. That's what you want, isn't it? You, you, want, you want your Space Marines to have those heroes coming in and winning the day. And having the Honor Guard commanders uh, being able to ex exceed that limit is quite useful. Uh, it allows you to field more more, more badass people. You know, give, give you that nice D&D uh, &D, uh, group kind of feel as, as you get all your high-level lads on the field and working together in tandem. So I quite like that. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's a nice uh, little, little uh, buff for the Space Marines. Gives a bit more of a focus as well. Let's them, uh, even though they're, they're a vanilla faction... It separates them a little bit more from the other Space Marine chapters, which I quite like. 
Uh, for the second point I want to bring up is that the Stain Guard veterans, they made the weapons cheaper, they've reduced the cap by one, uh, they've increased the maximum weapon upgrade capacity from four to five after researching the Devastator Doctrine, and they've also reduced the health of them uh, from 100, well, sorry, from 1,200 to 900, uh, reduced the health of Sergeant, and also reduced the cost of Sergeant from 150 to 125. So they, they've made the Stain Guard veterans a little bit more focused around the ranged stuff. Uh, sometimes you would see Stengard veterans and the oh Stengard Vanguard, whatever you, whatever you call those guys, Vanguard veterans probably, maybe, possibly. Uh, one is ranged orientated, one's close combat orientated, and you know you could kind of just use the Stengard veterans uh, in, in, in a close combat capacity sometimes. But now, now they've got now they've got a very clear, distinctive path. It, it, it separates them from the close combat boys, which is pretty sweet. And maybe it's not a big thing, but the third one I want to mention is that the dreadnought has got a little bit of love, because uh, quite often you will see only Hellfire dreadnoughts being used in games. Just sad because you know I mean the the regular dreadnought he's, he's got he's got he's got some uses with his punching ability. So they've increased the range of the assault cannon. Or the Dreadnought from 30 to 50. And also slightly improve the moving accuracy of the Assault Cannon by 10%. So that might not be a huge change. But it might be enough to uh, encourage players to give the regular Dreadnought a try. I mean, I understand it's slow. It's cumbersome. Um, quite a, a, like I mentioned earlier on, a lot of melee units struggle with getting involved in close combat. Because quite often times people just run away from them. But if you give him an Assault Cannon and improved moving accuracy that should help him do some damage even if opponents are running away from him so maybe we'll see a couple more dreadnoughts rather than the hellfire cousins uh, than usual these sisters of battle they've, they've had quite quite a light, a light touch i would say there's not much changing for the sisters in uh 7.0 essentially the three points that i want to bring up is that the castigator has had its battle cannon upgrade moved from tier 3 to tier 4 so it's going to be a lot less uh, effective at blowing stuff up uh, in the uh, early, well, the late mid game, early late game, however, however you would want to describe that. Uh, Lightning Fighters, they've had a reduction of the art penetration for the last cannons by vehicles and uh, against all buildings as well. So Lightning Fighters, uh, you know, I mean, fast, nimble as all air fighters are, and but they're going to be less effective against vehicles. So that's, you know, just quite often you will see these sisters of battle uh, build up a couple of jet fighters just because they're just good against everything, essentially. So making them less good against everything will give them a specific purpose, I suppose. And the Retributors have had their two limit uh, removed that was shared with the Xerophins. So I, I, I quite like that. So you've got your Retributors, you've got the Xerophins going about the wicked foul business on the battlefield. And, you know, you, you, can, now have, you can now have both. Uh, you, you've got more flexibility in your unit compositions for the Sisters of Battle, which is pretty neat. Uh, again, again I, don't, I don't think there's been many changes for the Sisters of Battle. Not that I could see that would absolutely change the way that we see them on the channel. But, you know, it, it, it's, I had to include them because I had to. Because I can't, I can't miss one out, otherwise the Emperor might be sad. And I, I've got to include his ladies. That I've just got to include the lasses, because why not? Now for the Tau Empire, there's been a bunch of changes that I did not expect, but I assume this is probably in relation to the, oh, what's called them, the, the Farsa Enclave coming out. Farsa Enclave, we, we saw them on the video yesterday, and they've got, the, the primarily, the, there's no crew, there's no Vespids, there's no, none of that nonsense, they are pure, unadulterated Tau. So there's been a couple of changes to make sure that the regular Tau Empire have got a bit more flexibility in their greater good companions. So, for the first point, the Recruit Shaping Centre has now been renamed the Auxiliary Recruitment Centre has been moved from Tier 2 to Tier 1. So, that's where you're going to get. And from what I can gather from the other patch notes, I'm not including this video, but a lot of the other non-Tau units are now recruited from there as well. So, you can either go for a Tau Focus build, where you build the regular Tau production building, and you get all your, your regular Tau units out, or you could build the Auxiliary Recruitment Centre and go for an off uh, blue people uh, kind of build. Which I quite like. It, it gives you a very clear path to go. 
And I do believe that the uh, Tau Commander now comes out from the HQ building. And you can't recruit him until you've built either the uh, regular Tau production building or the auxiliary recruitment center. So you've got to commit. You've got to commit to one or the other in the early game. Uh, Pathfinder as well. They've also been moved from Tier 2 to Tier 1. Although their mark abilities have now... Well, that are still a Tier 2 requirement. So you can't get them uh, too early. But the Pathfinder is able to increase the line of sight for a lot of units. They'll still be quite useful. So if you do plan to go for a majority like a Tau Fire Warrior Ball or something, the Pathfinders will be able to do you some good in there. And again, another thing that I did not expect, the so, so the third point I want to bring up is that the jump there's jump research for tanks. Uh, it's available in Tier 4, uh, regardless of what path you go for. And, I mean, it affects Devilfish, Sky Rays, Drone Harbingers, Hammerhead Gunships, and Commander Long Strikes Gunship. So, fairly often, I would say, that the town, what they do is that they build up a bunch of Christ battle suits, they jump into battle, and then they die quite quickly because they lack the staying power and the DPS uh, if you're just jumping in the middle of someone's base. But if you can also get your tanks to jump with them, uh, that's quite strong. That, that, that's, that's quite a strong thing to have. I mean, you know, chilling out your base one day, and all of a sudden the greater good just turns up. So, yeah, I, I, quite, I quite like that change. Uh, although the maximum number of jumps is set to one. So once you jump in, that's it. You're not escaping for quite some time. So you need to absolutely make sure that the engagement that you're taking is something that you can win. Otherwise, you're going to lose all your tanks. So I do quite like that. How would one say the, the risk factor in those jumps? So the Source of a Lord for the Thousand Suns. We've seen them on the channel before. And while a fair few of his changes... Are orientated around the spells. One thing I wanted to focus on was his melee combat. Now I, I understand that. Yes, okay, the Source of Lord. Uh, in law, he is a augmented human, which means he can punch the crap out of most people, especially with that big staff of his. But he was ridiculously strong in close combat. And I mean, the changes explain uh, what what they've done to him. So they've reduced the stun chance from 30% to 10%. They've reduced the movement speed reduction chance from 80% to 50%. And, yeah, so so quite often you will see a Sorcerer Lord go into combat, bonk someone on the head, and then that's it. You know, they, they essentially are now more or less locked into combat with the Sorcerer Lord. Or at least they've slowed them down enough so other people, other people can shoot the enemy hero down. Which, you know, I mean, it, it's it's... When you've got a spellcaster, you ideally want all the power to come from their spellcasting and not their melee. And while we're not seeing any damage reduction, it's, you know, the, the fact that now people are able to potentially get away from him a little bit more consistently should uh, help them. Because, I mean, there's nothing worse than sending your commander in, you know, they're doing some harassment, maybe then do some macro in the base, you're building up some buildings, you come back to your commander, you've been bonked once by the Thousand Sun Sorcerer Lord, and then that's it. It's just a slow death from there. So I, I, quite, I quite like those changes. Another thing for the Thousand Sons is that the Demon Prince has had its Relic requirement removed. And that it's also had its Shed Limit of Araman removed as well. I don't think I've ever actually seen a Thousand Sun player build a Demon Prince. Probably for these reasons. It requires a Relic and it re it prevents you from recruiting Araman. And of course you want to get Araman because he's a bloody the best sorcerer in the entire game. He's got like what, like about like a choice of like twelve spells any one given time. So I hope this change means that we're able to see more demon princes. And then the final one is the Hellblade, which is a the staple of the uh, Thousand Suns roster. Uh you, it's got his autocons damage reduced by ten percent. It's reduced its building armor penetration by fifteen. And well it gets low buildings. 10 against medium and 5 against high and its range reduction is re uh, reduced from 40 to 35 um, Hellblades essentially for the Thousand Suns, build a couple of them and then when there's a battle going on you send them on the flanks and you get them to kill plasma generators and all that stuff, so while they're still able to do, I would say based on these notes, a fair bit of damage it will give the opponent a bit more time to react so obviously if you're able to kill people's plasma generators very quickly then they're dead and then they just fly away. But if you give them a little wind of opportunity to run back up, 
and maybe stop them, then that's that's pretty good. Quite like that. So two minutes have had a fair few changes to their early game. Uh, the first one I meant to mention is the Spore Mines. They've had a increased cost from 55 requisition to 75 requisition. They now also cost one influence. And their damage is reduced by 25%. And their reduced slow effect is reduced from 50% to 25%. So the big thing here is the added cost of one influence. So the tunes basically rely on influence to tech up and get all their buildings and stuff online. And in the early game, you would often see players spam spore mines to uh, uh, help their other faction, oh, oh, sorry, their other units to kill other stuff. Uh, and you just constantly throw them down. They do a lot of damage, do a big slurp, and it's all gravy. But adding one influence to them in the early stages of the game, when influence is very slow to uh, accumulate, it will then discourage too many players from just spamming up the spore mines all day long. They'll either have to be a lot more tactical with the spore mines, or if they want to spam the spore mines, then they've got to delay the uh, tier 2. Which, yeah, I quite like that. Uh, the Gene Sealers, they've had a reduction to their building damage uh, penetration from 30, 20, and 10 to 25, 10, and 5. So, they've also had the speed reduced, the base DPS reduced by 15% of the Scythe weapon upgrade, um, but I've also had the upgrades for them uh, decreased from 15% to 10% on quite a, a, a fair few things. So what they've done here, from what I can gather, is that they've made them a lot less uh, harassy in the early games. You don't, you won't see them going around contesting too many listing posts. But because their upgrades are now a lot cheaper, in theory, they'll be able to... Because quite a lot of times you'll see in the game, or in the games that I've casted, that the Tyranids would basically do a bunch of fighting, and then at some point they get all the upgrades for the Gene Stealers, they become super duper strong, they go in and they kill the base behind the back lines. But this uh, change in them will make them... I, I, I suppose it makes them more orientated towards a late game. Uh, I mean, because the Gene Stealers are the capping unit for the Tyranids. But as the game goes on, and the uh, upgrades come in, it should do a lot more damage. So it's, yeah, it, it, it solidifies them as a early game capper and a late game uh, base harassment unit. And then the third one is the Hormagons. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Tyranid little guys uh, build order, mainly because Tyranids are a swarm, and I like the idea of a swarm. So they've had their initial cost reduced from 110 requisition to 150 requisition. They've had an increase reinforcement cost from 15 to 20. The reinforcement time has been increased from 4 to 6. And their health has been decreased from 8, 180 to 170. So while they're initially a lot cheaper, uh, they are a lot more expensive in keeping online in those early game engagements. Which is interesting because... The old strategies for the Hormagons was, or Termagons, or, or any of the other little ones, they've also had uh, a couple of, of changes to them. So, but the idea of the Hormagons is that, hey, you build them up, you then send them into battle, and then you reinforce them while they're fighting, just to make sure that they're constantly uh, engaging in warfare there. But, I mean, this will, this will negate that. The cheaper they get out, but the harder to keep out, if that makes sense. A bit of a buff, a bit of a debuff, it's, it's, it's a hybrid combination of the two there for them. So the penultimate faction for the video today is the World Eaters. And they've had a fair few changes in their economy bonuses. Generally, they've uh, had a reduction in the amount of money that they can generate when engaging melee. If, you, if you're not aware of the World Eaters, when you engage in close combat, and some of the units, I think, in ranged combat, uh, they generate more money for the World Eaters. So that, you know, if, if they engage lots of argy-bargy in any stage of the game, they get a bunch of money, and units like Commander Units, uh, Demon Prince, who else is there? There is the Blood Terror, and Demon Host, Technomancers, people like that. Essentially, they, they've had their economy bonuses reduced by a smidgen. So, from what I can gather, the big bad units that survive forever and ever are meant. Uh, they've had it just reduced just because they're probably going to survive a lot longer in close combat. 
Whereas the lesser units, or the smaller, more fragile units, I don't think they've been changed that much in it. So the well units can expect a lot less economy in the later games, but in saying that they've probably already got their um, power and requisition upgrades from their Blood Apothecary. So not, not, not a major change, just a slight tweak, I would say. So it won't affect that many Weldy players, in all fairness. A uh, second point, a huge point, actually, is that the Cornet Lord now has had his DPS adjusted to be similar to the Chaos Lord. We've seen so many times on the channel the, the Cornet Lord coming out being, ah, yes, I am the king of DPS in melee combat. And then him just being slapped around. Just being slapped around, which is not really what you want for a Cornet Lord. And the final one is with the Raptors. So quite often you would see a lot of players, they would get a bajillion million Raptors, send them into the base or the front lines of an enemy opponent in the early stages of the game and kill them with uh, great prejudice. So they've, they've, they've been massively reduced here. They've had the five health regen been reduced while in melee to be a lot less durable when engaged in constant warfare. They've also had a reduction in the amount of damage that they do to buildings and vehicles from the Raptors Sergeant Power Fist. So that 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 make, that that's good. Because ideally, re really, I mean, does Korn enjoy buildings and vehicles being destroyed? No, he wants blood being spilt. So maybe a thematic change, but I, I, I do quite like the idea of the Raptors not just being this really super oppressive threat where the moment you leave your base, you're going to lose some buildings. And again, like I said earlier on with another faction, the fact they do less damage against a, a vehicle or a building does then give the opposing player a bit of time to develop a counter strategy and go up against them and maybe show them off away. And then the Witch Hunters. So the first thing for them is that the Seraphins have had a bit of a nerf. Uh, the build cost has increased from 220 requisition and 20 power to 240 requisition and 20 power, which makes them a little bit more expensive. And uh, they've also had the reinforcement cost Increase from 50 requisition and 50 and 5 power to 60 requisition and 5 power. Uh, they've also had a reduction damage output, or should I say penetration, against low buildings for their melee attacks. And their squad pop has increased from 2 to 3. So I think maybe potentially the idea here is that the Seraphins... I mean, if you're playing Witch Hunters, you're playing Witch Hunters, aren't you? If you wanted the Seraphin rush early game, just 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 play the Sister Battle, you know? Just, just, just go for them instead so maybe this is going to differentiate the witch hunters from the sisters of battle just a little bit of those opening builds uh but although in saying that the second point i wanted to build up as well maybe counteracts that is that the celestians have now had their limit of three being removed so i suppose that maybe gets them a little bit closer towards the sisters of battle making them a bit more ho homogenous homogeneous whatever way do you want to use that uh and celestians very strong, very strong unit. So uh, I, I I don't know uh, if if that is congruous with the change of the Seraphins. But I mean, you know, Witch Hunters, they don't have incredible amount of anti-vehicle stuff if you go for the uh, Sisters build order or build path even, because you can go you can go two ways with them, much like uh, oh, what were they called? We forget the name. But other other factions where you've got you've got a choice of different um, tech paths and stuff. And the third one, the Arco Flagellants. So these guys basically get a squad of those um, out, and then they would charge up the enemy line, and they would just live forever and be a real nuisance. So they've had a reduced knockback, so they provide less disruption. They've had a reduction in the health for each model from 680 to 580, so 100 for each individual model. Uh, they've got an increased building cost, increased reinforcement cost. They've removed the health regeneration while in close combat. And they've also reduced the melee damage resistance and the range damage resistance. So they're going to be a lot more fragile, a lot more expensive. So a bit more glass cannon. I don't know if that puts them in line with, say, units like Banshees and stuff like that. But they are quite tanky in the grand scheme of things. But without that health regen in combat... It's good. They're going to have to go in, do what damage they can, and then run away as best they can. And then the last faction that we are going to discuss today, it is the Yanari. So one thing that the Yanari have is that, well, unique to them compared to all other factions, is that when they're on the battlefield, they have 
Crone sword locations spawned on the map. And the idea is that they were able to capture those, gain a big buff, and just murder all their opponents. The problem with the Crone sword locations, though, is that sometimes they were spawned so close to the enemy base, there was no point in even trying to capture all the points, because, like, if you can't capture all of them, you don't get the buff. It's either all or nothing. And if you've got a Crone sword location spawned in the enemy base or near them, it's just basically put to all that. So in capturing a Crone Sword location, what now happens is that they provide a 1 plus to the normal and maximum population cap to the maximum of plus 5 for birth. Which, I quite like that. It now gives the uh, Yunari a purpose to actually capture them. Because especially in the early game, uh, it gives them more squad cap. And in the late game as well, it also gives them maybe potentially one more bigger unit. Maybe one more uh, talented infantry squad which yeah because because in in this game a lot of the uh problems with the crone sword locations is that they just didn't really provide much of a buff not not much of a useful thing and also as well in this patch note is that it says that the testing introduced a new map system for the crone swords so in theory he says uh they'll be more optimally placed maybe in the center of the map maybe towards the yunari just so that way the yunari players can actually for once uh, capture all, all the crone swords by having to go balls to the walls into a enemy's base. Second point is much like the Dark Eldar, the warriors have had some uh, adjustments and range changes to the shredder rifles to so make them a lot less impressive in the early game. And the third and final one is that Yvrain. She's got the what was in in the patch that's got the first ability. I always call it super mind warp because essentially you, you zap someone, there's a significant amount of damage to them. And it's no good fun for them. But now that ability costs one soul. So you can't really spam it out that much. And they've also increased the cooldown of the uh, ability of the of their Super Mind War from 60 seconds to 90 seconds. So Yvrain is now not going to be the ultimate mind warring champion. You can't exactly just what walking and delete an enemy commander. No, it's it's gonna it's gonna require a little bit more planning and also a lot more cost. In regards to the souls. Oh, so here we are. We've made it. We, we are at the end of the video. And call blimey. Looking at my recording time. It makes me weep. This was meant to be a really short video. And it turned out to be not a short video. So there you go with all that information. But yeah. The, 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 the three main points I think from a PvP perspective. And especially a casting perspective. Uh, that, that, that's, what, that's what I've done. That's what I've done. The, the clues in the title of the video. I've done the things. I said I was meant to do. And now I'm probably going to go to bed because it's quite late in my area at this moment in time. But, again, Laughing Max, he's got a wonderful video on it. There's a lot more detail than what I've done. And I will leave the Unification uh, Discord and ModDB uh, links uh, below. So if the, if these facts have turned last year, then by all means have a look. Go and bloom in, download it and play some games. Done some replays while you're at it, why not? Just because, you know I mean? Just, just do it, because I've asked nicely. And, yeah, so let's just end it there. Uh, Mine's been Miss Landshark. Pleasure's always never chore. And I'll see you in a bit. Peace.